God is near to you when you are praising. But then he said, God is near to you like always, right? Does God get nearer to you when you're worshiping? How can God get nearer than being God? God is always near, but we sense his presence when we worship. So when the problems come and so on, start singing praise songs to the Lord. Turn off talk radio and turn on something that just blesses your heart, because I'm pretty sure talk radio won't. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Joshua chapter 10. You know, some days are so amazing, so out of the ordinary that we say this, I'll never forget this day as long as I live. Have you ever said that before? Well, Joshua has one of those days in chapter 10 in this book that, that bears his name. And I believe we can too, more often than we realize. The thing is, Joshua never would have had this day if he hadn't been moving forward for his God and if his life was problem-free. You don't usually bump into the devil when you're going the same way. But if you go against the devil because you're going with the Lord, you're going to bump into him all the time. He will use whatever he can to stop your advance for Christ, personal failures, foolishness, like we saw in chapter 9, every kind of trouble, problem, temptation, every stubborn habit. But God is bigger than them all. And you're thinking to yourself, when do you get to this stuff that I don't know? Because we all know that, right? God is bigger than everything, every problem, every enemy. God is bigger than everything. But, but then why do we waste so much time worrying about things and trying stuff in our own power rather than trusting the Lord to fight for us? God is bigger than everything is good theology, but we need to ask a more personal question. How big is your God today? Don't tell me you need more faith before you can follow the Lord because you have all the faith you need to trust him right now. Remember when Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20, if you have faith as a, as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. A, a mustard seed, you, you can't even see it, it's so small. You got a little, little, little tiny seed. If you have that much faith, you can speak to mountains. If you have that much faith, nothing is impossible. Yes, our faith grows, but you don't need any more faith than you have. God gives us what we need to do what he told us to do. It's not like I'll serve the Lord someday when my faithometer gets up to this level. Use the faith you have. Use the faith in the God who has given it to you and take a step. The problem is, as believers, we don't believe what we believe. We don't act on the faith God has already given us. Or we don't exercise that faith in real time. In our message this morning, we will see why Joshua's day was so extraordinary, but ex discover how we can have days like this as well. Our text is Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. And it's a beautiful and amazing passage. Um, we're going to look just at these verses. We're not going to look at the whole chapter. I, I'll tell you what happened. I read it myself. You can read it later. I really want to focus on, on these verses because there is something that happens. That, that's extraordinary. Verse 1 says, Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty warriors, heroes. Therefore, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Jephia, king of Lashish, and Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lashish, and the king of Eglon gathered together and went up, they and all their armies, and camped before Gibeon to make war against it. I want you to see then the things that happened on that day. That day that was unprecedented. That day that verse 14 says has not happened before or since. That day, some things happen that are, that are again, unprecedented. Now, there's a brief respite from battle in chapter 9, right? We had fraud, not fighting. But now the fight is on, and it's on steroids in chapter 10. 
Many of Canaan's cities are, are they're more of a city-state. They have a king, they have several uh, towns that are dependent on them, kind of clustered on the outside. So you have city-states, you've read about that in your history. If you go back a few, a few years, uh, you'll remember that. And so we have these city-states. Gibeon is one of those city-states. There's five more mentioned here. And the others then in the region are none too happy about Gibeon's betrayal as they see it. The treaty that Gibeon signed with Israel has changed the dynamic in a big way. So now that they're on the same page, look at verse 1. There's a Jewish base in the middle of Cana, Canaan, right? It says how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. That's an important statement. So not only is the enemy Israel coming against them like a flood and just taking over, taking over. Now Israel has a foothold in the middle of the region. So the fact that Gibeon is now a Jerusalem ally, or an Israel ally rather, in the midst of them is a problem, is a problem. And so the, the part of the reason they're angry is uh, revenge, payback, is one reason for their aggression, because they did this to them. But so is fear. Gibeon, they call it a city of, of heroes. It's mighty men are not afraid of anything. If they sued for peace without even considering a fight, what chance do the lesser kings have? Because the other kings here, it seems like, are, are lesser than the one. So they said, if we gain together, alliance, ally ourselves together, we can do something maybe. But by themselves, they're saying, it must be worse than we thought. And so they come together, they make an alliance, these five kings in their five city-states, and they're going to attempt to wipe Gibeon off the face of the earth and good riddance. So what's going to happen now? I mean, Joshua could say, when he hears about it, oh, that's good, my problem is solved, right? I made that big mistake, that was really dumb, it was wrong, but now, if I delay getting there, no problem. Gibeon, what Gibeon? He could have done that. He doesn't. He's a man of God. But even, even the kings that are coming against them, they're going to see, it's kind of a test. Is Israel going to stand with that treaty? Now, if Israel doesn't, they don't care, they've just destroyed Gibeon. If Israel does honor it, then the kings are going to say, bring it on. Two birds, one stone. Because the five of us against the two of you, we're liking our odds here. So that's what's going on here, if you see the, the first few verses here. But Israel does honor the agreement. Joshua and the leaders are people of their word and people of God. And so when Gibeon sends for help in verse 6, um, do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. This is like an SOS that, that is very urgent, right? They're here. We need you now. Save our souls. And to his credit, General Joshua just as quickly begins moving his army from Gilgal to Gibeon. Verse 7, so Joshua ascended from Gilgal. He and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. Now this is a 20 plus mile from Gilgal to Gibeon, 35 kilometers. And so it's a hike and it's, it's going uphill. Did you see that in verse 7? So Joshua ascended from Gilgal. So it's an uphill battle and they got to go 20 miles plus overnight to get there in time. It's good military strategy, right? Because they arrive there with such speed that they catch the enemy totally by surprise. In verse 9, he therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel. So I want you to see here that, that they're coming to the rescue. It's a super speedy all-nighter, and they get there. You got the, the Amorites are on the field, part of the Canaanites. You got the Gibeonites, you have the Israelites, but God is on the field as well. Look at Israel's involvement in the fight. With just a few words and great clarity, the account tells us Joshua's army is good at what it does. What do, what do armies do? They kill people and destroy things. That's their two jobs. They do that very well here. And so we see that in here, verse 10. The Lord routed them before Israel. Then we see that Israel killed them with a great slaughter of Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horon, struck them down as far as Azekah and Makedah, and so we see that Israel kills with a great slaughter, chases them down the road, pursues them, hunts them down, strikes them down. So Israel is definitely doing their job. In verse 11, it talks about the sword being used. So we know that Israel is doing something because God's not wielding a sword in this story. So Israel does have a part to play. But that's just part of the story. God is the victor here. Did you see verse 8? Did you notice I skipped over that? 
It's not because it's hard to, to decipher. Let's go back to it. On the way there, right, sometime between help us and the, the, the all-night trip, the Lord says to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. That's quite a promise. Has God said that before to Joshua? He did in chapter 1, didn't he? I mean, he's been saying that kind of all along. And so he says, don't fear. I will deliver them into your hand. I will deliver them. In fact, it's a done deal when God says it. Not a single man will stand before you. Now, that's very important. Remember that because from verse 8, Joshua prays an amazing prayer. If he didn't know verse 8, he couldn't pray verse 12. So this is very important. We'll come back to this. All right. So Israel's involvement is to break things and kill people. Right? And God gives encouragement in verse 8, but he also gets engaged. And we see his intervention. So there is Israel's involvement. Hey, you and I need to be able to do what God's told us to do. But God has his part that he alone can do. Uh, we talk about that with, with uh, witnessing. I want my neighbors to come to Christ, don't you? When I, I, when I walk, when I run, when I drive by my neighborhood, I pray for them. I have the most prayed for neighborhood in the city, maybe, because I go and drive and walk and crawl and shuffle a lot in my neighborhood. I pray for their salvation. Pray by name if I know them. Pray by house if I don't. But the thing is we need to to understand that God doesn't say to me, okay, you prayed for them, your job is done. He he sticks a tract in my hand. I need to go and meet my neighbors. And so I need to put feet on those prayers. So there is involvement, but God is the reason that they win. What does it mean in verse 10 that the Lord routed them? It means to throw them into a panic. How many times does that happen? And remember the different times in Scripture? where there is a battle and the Lord just kind of shakes them to their toes. That's what he's doing here. It's, it's psychological warfare, I guess. And so Israel is able to prevail. They force the enemy to retreat along a 10-mile path to the south, verse 11. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent, so we're going down here, of Beth Horan, that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. So there were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. There's a lot of neat, neat things here. But I was going to show you a picture. I forgot to get one to, to the uh, secretary to put up there. But I want you to picture this if you can. It's a 10-mile path to the south. It's a trail that drops precipitously 700 feet in less than two miles. And it's all uh, rock and it's built in, in steps. So the people of the Amorites had been routed. They're running away. They're dying as they go. Israel is, is pursuing them. In fact, there's high ground on either side. And so Israel has the high ground, but God has the higher ground because he's throwing stones at them. Large stones. Now, they're heavenly hailstones, but these are big stones. I mean, in that area, there's huge stones anyway like, you know, six, eight inches. But this is even extraordinary compared to that. The word for stones is the same word. Every time you see the word stones in the book of Joshua, it's the same word. So I don't know, some of the stones like made, making altars? That's a big stone. So God is throwing these stones on them as they're running away. So God is fighting. That's the first of two miracles of intervention, by the way, the, the heavenly hailstones of tremendous size. It's very selective because... The stones are not falling on the Israelites, right? And can't God do that? Doesn't he do that with, with Goshen? You know, that all the plagues of Egypt, they came on the Egyptians and not, not the, uh, the Israelites, the Jews. God can do that. He's doing that here. So they're very selective and they're very effective because in verse 11, more were killed by the hailstones than by the swords of the whole army. Remember, the army, he has 701,000 plus fighting men available to him. That's a lot of swords. But God is doing something. God's intervention. Now you'd be forgiven if you didn't remember the stones because of the second thing that happens. Because all we know about this passage is what? The sun stood still. So let's get to that part. If I had sleeves, I'd be rolling them up right now. All right. Then verse 12, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, sun stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Echelon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. So picture this, please. Israel is in full battle gear and they're running after the enemy. Think of the, the screams and the cries, cries of fear and panic from the Amorites, cries of bloodlust 
to be honest with you, from the, Israel, the Jewish people. And they're running after them, pale mail down this thing, 10 miles. They're, God's throwing in stones. And Joshua looks up, and the sun is going down. Now, have you ever had a day in your life, I know you have, when you haven't gotten the things done that you wanted to get done, and it's, and it's nighttime? Have you ever said, oh, it can't be nighttime, I'm not done with daytime? Have you ever said, I can't do tomorrow, I'm not done with today? I actually said that to the Lord, and the Lord doesn't change the clock for me, but I've said to him, it can't be tomorrow, I'm not done with today yet. So I go to bed 12, 1, 2, 3, because it ain't tomorrow till my job's done, right? So the idea here, he says, we are supposed to, what? What does it say in verse 8? Not a single man will escape. They're escaping. See, the kings want to go to their fortified cities. If they can get to their cities, they have some protection. They can live to fight another day. But that's not what God promised. The word of the Lord to Joshua directly, personally, unequivocally was given in verse 8, right? Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua, knowing what God has said, has the faith to believe it and says, Oh, Lord, help me. Look at verse, verse 12. He spoke to the Lord. People, some commentators said he shouldn't have been praying to the Son. Get over yourselves. He didn't pray to the Son. He prayed to the Lord. He spoke to the Son after he prayed to the Lord. That's so obvious it shouldn't even be spoken. So forget that I did. It's already, you didn't even think that. You didn't even worry about that, did you? But there's this thing about the Son thing. So, so I, I've looked at like 12 or so books just try to get other commentators' idea because there's some heavy stuff going on here. So I talk to the Lord. I read his book. I read other books. That's okay. Don't feel sorry for me. I love to read. All right? But I find some interesting things. Here's the top four options about what really happened. Number one, the sun standing still. Those words are poetical. It's just an allegory. It didn't really happen. He just said, God take care of me and God took care of me. That's the first option. Second option, the sun's rays are merely refracted in a way that makes it look like the sun stood still. There's a commentary I'm not buying, and I got it from the library, not ours. The third thing, Joshua isn't asking for a longer day at all. One guy said he's just asking for relief from the heat of day. <laughs> Is that what your Bible says? All right. Here's the fourth option. The sun and the moon stood still. <laughs> Full disclosure, <laughs> I have a policy about things that God says he's done. I believe it. I'm not going with one, two, or three. If God says the sun and the moon stood still, brothers and sisters, I don't need any convincing. You have the same policy, I know. But wouldn't a 24-hour stoppage in the heavenly lights stop or at least slow down the very rotation of the earth? And wouldn't that be disruptive? Well, what do you call a miracle? A divine disruption of the natural order of things. I mean, yes, it's a disruption. That's called Hello, miracle? I mean, if, if natural stuff happens naturally, that's not a miracle. It's when God intervenes and does something that we couldn't do ourselves in a way that's never been seen before, in a way that doesn't make sense, in a way that makes the scientists scratch their heads and say, oh, you crazy Christians, yes, that's us. God said it, we believe it, and that settles it. God did it. God owns the celestial bodies. He placed them in, in space. He do what he wants with his stuff. Read with me, please. Colossians 1, 16 to 17. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things are held together. Right? So he said, here's your circuit. Here's what you're going to do in the morning. This is going to happen in the evening, that. And if he wants to change that, I'm okay with God being God. So God does stop the sun in his tracks. And the extra daytime hours enable God's people to finish the job and defeat the armies. Later, the five kings, they sneak off, by the way. When they see they're losing, they sneak off to a cave in the rest of the text. And Israel finds them in there because kings are loud, I guess. I don't know. And um, so they rolled a stone in front of the cave and made sure there was no back entrances. And later on, well, you guys okay with this? Verse 26. Afterward, Joshua struck them and killed them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging on the trees till the evening. So there you go. There's, there's what's going to happen. So their people are, are destroyed. The kings are gone and the whole thing. So would you agree? Oh, oh by the way. This, in one fell swoop, Israel has destroyed the entire 
Southern Confederacy, and the land is open before them. Because they got some more years to go after them. You got Jericho was sitting still. Ai was sitting still. Now they've taken on this confederacy, and the, the land is open to them. I think that's a lot to happen on that day. A lot happens on that day. But how about the things that can happen in this day, in our day? Before we answer that, what would you say the main theme of this text is? Joshua 10, 1 to 15. Tithing? End times. Child raising? It's prayer, right? I mean, I don't think any pastor, you'd be sued for malpractice, ministerial malpractice, if you didn't see that. It's a message about prayer. It's a passage about prayer, about talking to God. Now, lots of verses tell us how to pray, right? Pray without ceasing. Pray in faith. Pray with humility. Pray in the spirit. Pray with thanksgiving. Pray with, with holiness. Um, James 5.16 says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, what? Uh, avails much. And Jesus gave the model for, oh, there it is. And Jesus gave the model for prayer in Matthew 6. You should pray like this. And so God gives us a lot of information about prayer. So why are we talking about prayer? If the food's done, we can just say, oh, I know prayer, let's go eat. My Sunday school class, the adult class, commercial, enter, insert commercial, 9.15, every Sunday we have an adult class, and we're studying prayer. So, not don't to offend anybody in my class, but I estimated your ages. <laughs> I got a pretty good idea. And so I thought, my class has a combined total of 1,500 years <laughs> experience in prayer. <laughs> yeah, you added 30 for yours. So, but you know, to pray and, and to have, I asked my, my class, how many sermons have you heard on prayer? Endless. So why are we still talking about prayer? Because I believe that we can still learn more. We're having great discussions in our classroom. The commercial continues. Feel free to come. It's a good time. But we're learning about stuff, and we're relearning, and we're learning from each other. But most of all, what? We're learning from the Word of God, and we're digging deep. I see two more things in Joshua's story that we can learn about prayer. To be effective, prayers should be aligned with God's will. Prayers should be aligned with the will of God. We know that. Determine, before you pray, determine if it is consistent with revealed truth. You hear about the little boy that came home from, from uh, school, and he wanted to ask God. He checked something real quick. He had put the wrong answer on a test. And so he said that the capital of, was, of is, Illinois was New York City. I don't know. And he prayed that God would, make, would change the, the capital from, uh, to, to New York City. God's not going to answer that prayer. Sorry, Sonny, you flunked, right? You, you can't, it has to be aligned with God's will. 1 John 5, 14, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, what? He hears us. So in Joshua's case, did God talk to him? Remember verse 8, let's go back there. God has promised a miracle. In verse 8, he said to Joshua, do not fear them. Maybe Joshua was fearing them. Why would God say that? I don't know. I have delivered them into your hand, past tense. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Do you think Joshua knew God was speaking? Or was he kind of uncertain? No, he knew. This is God. I don't know how God spoke to him, but God spoke to him. God knew, Joshua knew. That's good enough. He knew what God had said. Do you think he misunderstood what God said? Was this confusing? I was talking to someone this week who told me that 90% of the Bible is open to interpretation. And I said, you're about 100% wrong. <laughs> I, I said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Doesn't that mean that Christianity is exclusive? Depends how you define it. I said, okay. <laughs> Give me one of those discussions, right? <laughs> no, it's very obvious what God is saying and what he wants. In verse 8, listen, Israel is facing the combined Canaanite forces for the first time in an open, head-on encounter. It's not walking around a city, nice, nice trail, nice walking. They are going to be in battle like they've not been in battle before. They will not make it without divine intervention, intervention of the miracle type. And Joshua knows this is God's will for his life because the Lord has just told him that. So God promised a miracle, so what does he pray for? 
Uh, duh, a miracle. You said it. Verse 8, it's only four verses later, Lord, I'm ready with the request. So in verse 12, he spoke to the Lord. What did he speak about? Well, we know what he spoke about because then he talked to the Son. He knew he needed more daylight to fulfill the promise God gave him. He took God at his word. He perfectly aligned his want with God's will. And so he prayed, and he prayed well, and he prayed in alignment with God's will. Now, the second thing that we see is our prayers should be audacious. When's the last time you prayed an audacious prayer? What, what is an audacious prayer? Bold. Bold. It's something that most people, people around you would say, you're not going to want to say that. Right? Don't, oh, he said it. Right? You ask for something really big. To pray audaciously. How many of our prayer requests are small ball rather than asking for home runs? How often do we hold back or give God an easy out? Oh, Lord, please do this, but if you don't. Oh, Lord, I'd like you to, but you probably won't. Right? Or, Lord, I want to be healed, but just give me a good day. Help me make it to the doctors or something. How many times do we act like God's us? And so our prayers should be audacious. I can't believe what he says. It's audacious in, in uh, I think, three ways. Let me see. It's audacious in what he requests. Again, what an awesome ask this is. Joshua doesn't want a couple of hours for cleanup. He wants a whole extra day. He's not settling for a knockdown. He's going for a knockout. He wants to finish this right here and right now, and he prays accordingly. And again, have you ever asked God to keep tomorrow from coming until you finish today? Probably not. You may have said, Lord, don't let it rain. I'm sure you prayed that picnic time. But have you ever said, Lord, stop the raindrops from forming. May they never form again for 24 hours. May the, the economic, not the economic, but the atmospheric um, directions. No, you haven't done that. God could do that, couldn't he? He's audacious in what he requests. What does the Bible say? You have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, sometimes you ask amiss, right? You can consume it on your lust. But he says you have not because you ask not. So listen, put this in the Old Testament. If Joshua had not asked for the sun to stand still, would it have stood still? I don't think so. It would just keep on skipping through its day like regular stuff. The moon would do the moony thing. The sun would do the sunny thing. Joshua would not have gotten the battle done. It's audacious because of what he requests. It's also audacious because of where he requests. Sometimes the battlefield is better than the prayer closet. Sometimes public prayer is needed. But it ratchets the whole thing up when others are aware of what you're praying for. Do, let me ask you a question. Do you pray differently in public than you do in private? A bit. Sometimes we do. The, the, the real need of my heart, God already knows it, so I can be very honest, but maybe I'll give you an unspoken request to the crowd. But no need to do that with God. Do I sometimes say, God, I really need this miracle, but when I'm praying with everybody else, maybe I, I don't quite believe? I don't know, but I think it can happen. And the interesting here, thing here is, he says in verse 12, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of men. And he said, look, in the sight of Israel, and so he prayed right smack dab in the middle of everyone. Sometimes the audacious prayer is the audible prayer, and he spoke. There's no equivocating for this guy, no excuses. He's out there. Oh, Lord, do this. I mean, I can just see Mrs. Joshua, right? Don't ask for, oh, man, that's not going to look good. His political advisors, oh, boy, now you've stepped in it. He's just, oh, he's all in. God said it. He believes it. That settles it. So he's audacious in, in uh, what he says, in where he says it. But this is the one that really, this has boggled my mind all week, but I'm a little less boggled than I was at the beginning. Joshua is audacious in how he requests. That phrase in verse 14, look at that with me. Joshua 10, 14. And there has been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. It's kind of amazing because the word heeded means obeyed. Now, it's not unprecedented for God to hear us, right? If it says, it's never happened before that God hears the voice of a man, that's what prayer is. Every time we pray, he hears us. That's not what it says. That's not what it says at all. So when Joshua prays, listen, the son obeys, the moon obeys in a way that it's hard to comprehend. God obeys. 
He gives the stop order to his lights. Do you think the sun would stop because of Joshua? Try it sometime. Go out and talk to the sun. Knock yourself out. It's going to be a hot day, right? Oh, rain clouds. Get away from me in the name of Doug. Be gone. You're going to get wet. It, it's not that at all. God had to do this, but he did this heeding, hearkening to, obeying a prayer request of Joshua. Not even Moses, Israel's great leader, ever received such an honor. So you can close your Bibles and say, that was really cool. It's, it's great to be Joshua. Kind of stinks to be the other guys. But what's the question that you would ask? Is that possible today? Don't you want to know? Can I do that? See, it says it hadn't happened before or since, but I think that's talking about when the book was written. Remember when it said that these stones are here and they're here till this day? I've been to Israel. Their stones aren't there. It's talking about when it was written. There's a lot of sense that has come since this. I believe, I feel God's told me that it, it, it is something that we can have today, that we can pray an audacious prayer, a prayer that most people wouldn't pray, but a prayer that will get an answer. Doesn't it say, ask, and it will be given to you? Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. I believe these are truths for our age as well. Christ has come. A greater than Joshua is on the scene. The Holy Spirit resides in us. The scriptures are complete. God has gifted his church. I'm not talking about demands on the Lord. Don't go, don't go oh, name it, claim it, confess it, possess it on me. We can't demand from God. It's discernment of his will, not demanding of his will, right? He is sovereign. He's not servant. He's not my personal attache. Put in the right number, outcomes, you know, help me God, 1-800-GOD. It's not like we can do that. We have no right to tell him what to do. We cannot demand, but we can learn his will and lose our will in his so that his authority will be seen in us and through us. The matter is authority. Something God already has, and we will need at different times in life. Remember before the Great Commission? Go into all the world and give the gospel. What's, what comes before that? Remember? Jesus said, all authority is given to me. Go therefore. Therefore connects my going with his authority. So when I go in Jesus' name, Jesus just went. Right? It, it, it's an amazing thing that the authority God gives us enables us, us to do things that we could not do before. And I believe in that way, God is heeding us because we're in his will, because we're in the scripture, because we're walking in the spirit. Remember Jesus' disciples upon their return from a ministry assignment? Turn to Luke chapter 10. Some of these things uh, God gave me after we did the sermon notes. In fact, last night God woke me up with something. Thank you, Lord. Sweet. The sweet verse, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 20. Luke 10, 17 to 20. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Sun, stand still. Moon, stop that. Mountain, move. Get over there. Lake Michigan, pronto. Right? <laughs> demons, get out of here. In the name of Jesus. He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, Jesus said, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That's the, that's the power. When we know the will of God and we're consistent with the word of God, we are able to say and do things that are unheard of. Authority over the forces of darkness. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. You come to the devil in your name, what's he going to do? He's going to knock you right in the kisser. You come to the, to, to the devil in Jesus' name, he's taken some drastic steps, the back ones. He's out of here. This is a transferred authority. Look at John chapter 14. One more. I have to get all my late night verses for you. John 14. John 14, 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Listen, the Father hears the Son, and he hears us because we're in the Son, and because the Son 
is ours. This is the authority. This is the effective use of Jesus' name. This is what makes our prayers and his answers audacious and amazing. Now, could we say more on this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Should we study more? Please do. Be like the, the Bereans who studied these things to see whether they were true. But what God is showing me, after all my years' experience in prayer, preaching on prayer, going to seminars, I've been to prayer conferences, I've been to prayer concerts, for goodness sakes, I have a lot to learn. Because here's what I've been asking myself all week long. Are my prayers effective in that way? Fair question? Am I praying audaciously or am I holding back? Does God want to do more than I'm letting him do because of my lack of faith? Remember last week we saw Jesus could not do great works in the town because of their unbelief? So we have the prayer, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I know you want that confidence in your prayer life. Not for you. You don't want to spend it on your, your lust. You want to live for Jesus. He's coming back soon. Don't, don't you want to make a difference for the Lord now? Of course you do. Like you never have before. I have a good time talking to Brother Tom Hall. He sits there. He's so ready to serve the Lord. He can't, can't stay in his chair, right? I'm this time in my life, he said, and he's served the Lord for years, but he's saying, Ugh, the Lord's coming back soon. I'm getting old. And yet, I want to do more for the Lord. I love that. That's like Caleb. Remember Caleb? We haven't gotten to Caleb yet. He's 80 years old, and he says, I want this mountain. Give me, my, give me my inheritance. And that's what we do. We want the confidence in our prayer life. We want to live so close to Jesus that we begin to think his thoughts, speak his words, and pray his requests. So his done will be done on earth. His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's start making our prayer requests as big as our God. Jesus, we come to you. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Spirit, through the indwelling power that you give us, we want to be audacious prayer makers. We want to speak truth. We want to be able, in Jesus' name, to see great things happen. Oh, Lord, help us. We, we have, I know, this group, we could go on and give testimonies, but more. We want more. We want to be so confident, so sure of your will, that we're in your, your presence and that your, your name is strong in us. Oh, may your name be strong in each of us, the authority that you give us so that we can go out and make disciples. It's a jungle out there. It's an urban jungle. We need you. Oh, how we need you. Give us your awesome power, awesome grace. Release it in our lives as we are obedient to you and as we pray so that this day will be a day we'll never forget. So this day will be unprecedented. So never before or after was this day, this request, this ministry pleasing to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.